Well, hello everybody. I'm uh, Richard Thomas. I'm the uh, chairman of the Guernsey Data Protection Authority, and I'm joined uh, today, uh, April 19th, by Jakob, Jakob Konstam, uh, who is calling in from Amsterdam. Um, Jakob and I are veterans of the European data protection world, and I wonder, Jakob, you could just start by reminding me and everybody else of the three main positions you've held in the last 15 or so years. Yes, well, I, I was, uh, during nearly 25 years, active in the Dutch national politics. Um, uh, both, I was member of both chambers of Dutch parliament and of government uh, in several periods, but in total 25, nearly 25 years. And then I decided to do something decent um, in my career and, and apply to become the chair of the Dutch DPA, um, which I posted, I held for 12 years. And, and in that period, I also was elected a chair of Working Party 29, which is the gathering of all data protection um, authorities of the European Union. Um, so luckily at that time, Britain was part of the European Union. And so uh, I, I, I started to know you, Richard. And uh, nowadays, I'm like you said, the chair of the board of the Jersey DPA. Uh, very uh, glad doing that uh, as a last thing within the privacy sphere. Well, excellent, uh, Jakob. Uh, thanks for that reminder. Um, You've heard a little bit about Project Bijou, which we're launching uh, in the sister island of uh, Guernsey, which is all about the sharing the stories about behavior and culture inside organizations. Um, I wonder if, if you could perhaps start by telling us a story from your own experience, um, which perhaps graphically um, illustrates the impact um, of cultural change inside an organization. Yes, well, Richard, because of my political uh, background and, and career, um, may I focus on, on democracy and the way democracy works? Um, I was asked to um, become vice chair of uh, a committee that was installed by both chambers of Dutch parliament plus government very unusual that there's a committee that is installed by all these three um, organizations that was asked to have a look at the, um, the, the way our parliamentary democracy worked, whether it still worked the way it should work, uh, or that maybe there should be um, things changed in order to have a better outcome or a better representation within uh, our, our parliamentary democracy. Um, and, and it was in 27 uh, that we were installed and I, we, were, we all started saying what we really wanted to be discussed in that, what previously maybe was called a royal committee in, 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 in Britain, wouldn't you call it anymore, but that's... And I said, I'm very, uh, I'm very much afraid of the use of micro targeting um, and of uh, algorithms within the political system, because then um, there's no free choice anymore because you're in a bubble. The political party uses the algorithm and micro targeting to keep you within that bubble and democracy is freedom of choice on the basis of an open discussion and if possible on facts, um, which is at stake. And in 2017, this committee always uh, exists. Uh, the, the members are so-called esteemed, wise, senior ex-politicians. Sometimes they make a mistake by asking me to join but and some university professors we were eight of us and i told them this was the main subject that i wanted to put into that committee and 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 think how to manage that only one very young professor um 
said, Jacob, that's a good idea. All the others said, but Jacob, we have heard stories about you that is more interesting than this. What, what should we bother about? Now, um, this, is, this is our report. And uh, let me read out of a footnote of the ICO report of 11th of July, 2018. We are now at a crucial juncture where trust and confidence in the integrity of our democratic process risk being undermined. And thanks to uh, uh, Cambridge Analytica, uh, which, which we may or may not, you may or may not want to explain to those who listen to this and see this, but came up later in 2017 and beginning of 2018. And then the committee member said, my God, Jacob, did you know about all that? I said, no, I didn't know about all that, but this is exactly what I'm afraid of. And um, it, it changed the root of our our advising and 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 the way we did, and it is still at stake um, yeah. because you don't know what the maths behind the algorithms are. You don't know who is using it in social media. Uh, you know you don't know the owners. You need a lot of money, by the way, so it's not an easy task to do. But at least if we want to keep our parliamentary democracy alive then this is my great fear that we're not able to control what political parties are using in the sense of micro-targeting algorithm and social media. Yeah, I mean, you're making a really, in, really important and interesting point there. I mean, we often talk about data protection in human rights terms, but you're going even further. You're saying it's fundamental to the democratic process. It's about choice. It's about not suppressing or manipulating that choice. Um, that really almost scuppers my next question, uh, Jakob, because I was going to ask you sort of what are the main harms which can arise from uh, bad handling of personal data? And it's hard to think of anything worse than destroying or undermining democracy. But uh, can you perhaps <laughs> just share your, your thoughts about what other harms might uh, occur when data is not handled well? And let's let's uh, let let me stick to algorithms. Um, the Dutch government just a couple of months ago resigned because of the use of algorithm in a certain case where uh, racism sort of um, uh, played a, a role, um, where people were forced to. Um, to, to, to pay back all sorts of um, uh, money they got because the, the algorithm said they were probably not right. I mean, and, and I'm sticking to public and not to the private side because everyone always talks about Google and Facebook. And of mm -hmm. course, there's, there's reason to do so. But the government, more than any organization in any country, has all the data, personal data that they can play with, so to say. We are obliged to give our data to government. We're not obliged to give them to, well, more or less, but not obliged to give them to Google or Facebook, but we're obliged to give them to government, some of them, most of them, by the way. And so um, I think that the individual, um, is at stake and the individual is unique. Everyone is unique, you are unique. Everyone who's looking at us and listening to us is unique. Mm -hmm. And you need to treat people as unique and not because of a algorithm and, 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 and um, just give them a stamp mm -hmm. um, because you're living in that quarter, because you're uh, driving in a, smart, a car that is a little bit too big for that quarter, then you are probably uh, fraud is 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 probably the way government then will treat you. Um, so not democracy only is at stake. Like my first point, but also the individual. And that's why 
I'm very much on the side of those who say it's a human right. Yeah. And it's 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 and human rights generally come from the relation between government and the individual. And so and really so, you're saying it's, uh, it's democracy, it's human rights, but human dignity, and there is all completely uh, intertwined. Let, let's try and be positive as well, uh, Jakob. I mean, have you examples from your experience where an organization has really sort of improved its approach and actually brought some real benefits from good data handling? Yes, well, um, the, 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 there was, in the time that I was still the chair of the Dutch Data Protection Authority, that in the, the, the Dutch railway started to have a credit card where you can enter trains and, and, and pay with that credit card. And while building that credit card um, system, they were, um, the, the, it wasn't possible to, it was possible for them to exactly know where, when, and who went where, and then also there, um, uh, uh, be aware of all my um, use of, of public transport, where I went, when I went, and when I went back, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and so they were building that system, and we jumped into it and saw what they were doing and that it was very easy to do the same thing in financial sphere, but then without the personal data being kept there and used for other reasons, for example, for commercial reasons, then for payment reasons. And uh, although it was a difficult fight in the end, uh, the, the, with some publicity and, and help from, from, from some politicians, by the way, uh, they were forced to build a system that is exactly what it is built for, payment for your use, but not to build a big um, um, computer with all sorts of personal details in it. That, that's a great example, a great example of the uh, benefits of not holding too much data. One of the principles, of course, is to not have too much data, more than you need for a particular purpose. Final question, Jakob, you're, you're, you're a man of the people, you're formerly a politician, you're a man of the people of Holland and now of Jersey. How can ordinary people best secure the protection of their personal data? What can the man, woman in the street actually do to get better data protection? I'm, I'm certainly not giving the answer you want to hear because my final or my the bottom line is that it is so um, difficult to understand and know what organizations will do with your data. Um, I mean, you're not before you enter Facebook or, or Google, go and read all the all the privacy uh, no, uh, notices that are there. Um, um, it is more than an individual responsibility, much more than that, because being a human right, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, I'm not going to repeat that, but it is. How can you ever? know what's going to happen with your personal data and the only thing that you can do is be aware of the fact that others can use it in a in a way you don't want them to use it um uh be you, you don't need to be intransparent but keep as do ask yourself if an organization asks data, personal data, do ask yourself, is, is this what they really need to have the relationship that I wanted with that organization? Well, I'm not, finally, I'm, not, it, um, I'm not surprised or disappointed by your answer. <laughs> I mean, I often make the point that uh, a privacy notice can be sometimes as long as the uh, as Hamlet or Macbeth by Shakespeare. And people say, oh, I have read and understood that they tick the box. That's not healthy. That's creating a, a, a nation or a continent of yeah. liars. We cannot go by everything done by notice and consent. So I'm not surprised or disappointed by your response. But people do need to be aware of the importance of safeguarding personal data. 
<laughs> well, Yakov, that's been really good. It's a short conversation. Uh, you've made some very powerful points about the uh, democracy and about human dignity and human rights. You've uh, confirmed, if you like, that uh, there are limits to what we can do as individuals, but with good regulation, with good self-interest on the part of those who are running organizations, we perhaps can make good progress. So um, the people of Jersey are lucky to have you as their chairman. We're very lucky to have you this morning. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Well, thank you very much.